President of the European Council, Mr. Charles Michel, and this conference, uh, for this conference, simultaneous interpretation has been provided. Szanowny Panie Przewodniczący, Drodzy Koledzy, Premierzy, Wiktorze, Andrzeju, Igorze, to wielki zaszczyt tutaj móc Was gościć w Krakowie na tą specjalną bardzo okoliczność. Dziś na Wawelu spinamy symbolicznie 30 lat historii Grupy Wyszehradzkiej. Trzy dekady temu na Zamku Wyszehradzkim rozpoczął się nowy rozdział w tej części Europy. Wtedy już mieliśmy duże ambicje, choć pisany był pewnie ten rozdział nieśmiałymi zgłoskami. Jesteśmy już tutaj razem od 360 miesięcy mniej więcej i mówi się czasami, że historia zatoczyła koło, ale po tych 360 miesiącach jesteśmy w zupełnie innym miejscu niż to, z którego rozpoczynaliśmy. V4, Grupa Wyszehradzka to opowieść o zjednoczeniu, zjednoczeniu z Europą, o wzmocnieniu, o nowych wielkich ambicjach. Powróciliśmy bowiem do Europy na miejsce, które nam się należało, którego niesłusznie zostaliśmy pozbawieni po II wojnie światowej, czy właściwie na skutek II wojny światowej. Wielki zwrot polegał na tym, że wstąpiliśmy do NATO, wstąpiliśmy do Unii Europejskiej i nasze środkowoeuropejskie losy jak się okazało, wcale nie skazywały nas na, na słowo. Doomed us to be weak, to be beaten up, but we have started out on the journey of success. The difficult history gave us additional strength and offered an additional opportunity. And this is of uh, great importance. The Wyszechek the Visegrad group for the past five years have been much stronger than before. The last five years has showed that our collaboration was much stronger uh, in many areas. We've had uh, the very noble chapter of uh, Polish and Czech, uh, Czechoslovakian uh, history of solidarity, our resistance against communism, and our message to the nations of uh, Eastern Europe that was adopted by the first uh, assembly of the Solidarity Trade Union. Now, a few words about the contemporary history of the Visegrad Group. Over the past few years, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic and Hungary have been growing very fast. The economists and the commentators tend to claim that we are a driving force for the economic growth of the entire Europe. And this is true, the very fast-paced GDP growth, low unemployment rate, one of the lowest unemployment rates in the European Union, growing investments and very conducive investment environment has created a very friendly climate for business activity and for growing wages of our working people. The color has changed because of the pandemic. During today's meeting, we actually gave a lot of attention to the pandemic. We've been thinking together how to strengthen the European Union with the accelerated vaccination program and with the joint effort to Im improve the production capacity of vaccines for Europe so that we may um, vaccinate the societies and uh, revisit the regular economic growth. There is no partnership without the solidarity in our approach to fundamental challenges such as epidemic and the vaccination to protect us against COVID-19. And that was the spirit of our discussions today. But all these topics that um, challenges that we've been facing together with the entire Europe and the topics of tomorrow, of post-COVID world and the post-COVID uh, chapter must have solidarity and effectiveness in place. We have to be brave. We have to reach out for the new sources of the possible growth. And this is what we've been discussing today. We are putting pressure on the European Commission so that there are no stumbling blocks uh, on the journey of um, vaccination. 
our fight against, fight against COVID have to be jointly orchestrated around the European Union, and we have to think jointly about the economic recovery, because the world has come to a standstill because of the pandemic. But very soon, we will accelerate, and we need to make sure that the economic growth is somewhat different than it used to be. It has to be driven by the digital agenda. The new digital agenda, a very broad digital agenda, has been signed off today by all of us. Together with uh, Charles uh, Michel um, and colleagues, uh, prime ministers, we've been talking about the Eastern policy, which is fundamental for the safety and security of our region. Now, a few words about the future of the Visegrad Group as the part of the European Union and Europe at large. First of all, right here at the Central Europe, at the heart of the Central Europe, we, the Visegrad Group, we have the courage, we have aspirations, and we have the vision that we need to continue to work on, because this is a great opportunity to catch up with the Western Europe fast. And by doing that, we become a very valuable partner in business, in trade, in economy at large. And I am very happy that uh, today we have been able to agree on the enlargement of the Visegrad Fund. This is the fund for the youth that has been raised to 10 million euro. And it is first time during the past 20 years. Today, we signed uh, very important declarations. Such declarations have never, never been so detailed as the one that we have just signed today. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we are facing the world full of challenges. Europe is full of challenges, but I'm quite confident that with solidarity and courage, courage to look for the new social contract, for the new contract, if I may say so, between and amongst the member states of the European Union. With that, we should be able to step into the post-COVID era with the hope for a better future. I fully believe that despite the fact that the European integration is uh, under many pressures today, and sometimes uh, we feel that pressure, and our solidarity is also under strain of that. Nevertheless, today, here in Krakow, we have clearly demonstrated that we are able to work hand in hand, that we share solidarity, we are able to, uh, to agree on the most difficult things, and uh, such constructive, occasionally difficult discussions that we have within the Visegrad Group are also in Brussels at the European Union summits. We do need them. They are needed because this is where we actually bring our positions together and we are able to agree on a compromise, a compromise for the future, a compromise for the new, for the better European deal of the future. Again, I would like to thank my colleagues. I would like to thank and acknowledge great nations of Slovak Republic, Czech Republic and Hungary for being such a great partners of us, for this great cooperation with you. We have come where we are now. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. And now over to Charles Michel, uh, the President of the European Council. Good afternoon. And first of all, I would like to, to thank you, dear Mateus, for your invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here in Krakow for this very important moment, the anniversary of the Visegrad Group. And indeed, this is a critical time for Europe, a critical time for Europe. COVID-19 is a very difficult challenge and we need to work together. We need to, to cooperate together in order to, to make progress, in order to protect uh, our citizens and also to succeed at the economical and at the social level. And today we had the opportunity to discuss very important challenges that we have in common. We have also the opportunity to identify what are our common goals. And I think for us at the European level, there are certainly three important priorities. The first one, we will never forget that our European political project is based on fundamental democratic values. This is an important priority uh, for us. It's also a constant debate in Europe, in the rest uh, of the world. But this is important because 
it inspires our policy in the different field. The second important priority for us is the prosperity. How is it possible to improve the life of our citizens everywhere in Europe? And we think that we need to identify what are the pillars in order to succeed at the economic and the social level. Climate change, the digital agenda, these are difficult challenges, important challenges. These are also potential leverages in order to innovate, in order to make progress. We had the opportunity to discuss those topics. We know, and I know, that it's important to take into consideration the different situations at the national level in the different member states. We don't have exactly the same starting points, and that's why through the next European budget, that's why through the week of refund, we are trying to make the right choices and we'll continue in the next week, in the next month, to discuss with all the member states in order to decide together and to, to be able to reach the ambitious goals that we have decided by 2030 and the climate neutrality by 2050. And then my, my third point uh, was also mentioned by uh, Matthews the importance for, for Europe to be a global player and to have more positive influence in order to guarantee our safety, our security, in, our, in order to promote our values and to defend our interests. And thank you because today we have again the opportunity to discuss this important question of the Eastern Partnership. And we uh, think indeed with the other colleagues, with the 27 colleagues, that it will be important in the next weeks and months to tackle this question. I will have the opportunity to travel to Ukraine and to Georgia in the next uh, week in order to reaffirm the European position, the solidarity with the, integrity, with the, with the territorial integrity uh, um, of uh, Ukraine, of, uh, of uh, Georgia, and we need strategic debate at uh, the European, at the European uh, level. Finally, an important topic, COVID-19 and the vaccination campaign. It's very important to make progress together. We took the decision in Europe to uh, ask to the Commission to order uh, vaccines on behalf of the 27 uh, member states. And we, we understand that uh, right now the situation is difficult everywhere in the world. Also, it's a difficult situation in Europe. But I'm confident that we will work very hard in order to increase the production of vaccines, which is the priority number one. We have secured uh, many doses uh, of vaccines, but the priority number one is to make sure that we have enough doses as soon as possible. This is the task for the Commission, and we will have again next week an important video conference at the highest level with all the 27 leaders in order to improve the cooperation, to improve the coordination, and to make sure that we will be able to vaccinate our people as soon as possible. It's an important measure for the safety of our citizens, but also for the economic recovery. If we want to be able to have again a more normal life with the potential positive consequences at the economic and the social level, we need to succeed. It's a difficult challenge, but we are, we are really motivated and determined. Finally, again, uh, Matthews and dear colleagues, thank you. Thank you for this uh, uh, exchange of views today, which in my opinion is very important because the first condition in order to make Europe stronger is to be united. It's never easy. Uh, being united requires constant effort, and it requires to listen to each other, to listen, to listen actively to each other in order to be able to make strong and good compromises possible to make decisions together in the interest of all our European citizens everywhere in Europe. Dziękuję bardzo, panie przewodniczący. Bardzo proszę o zabranie głosu premiera. Thank you. And now over to Premier of Hungary, Mr. Viktor Orban. Dear Prime Minister, dear Mateusz, thank you so much for having us here today. I think that uh, a Pole can never do a better thing for a Hungarian but uh, host him in Krakow. That's the city. That's the city where 
we have always struggled when we wanted to breathe the air under the communism. We were escaping home, we were arriving here, and we felt that we arrived to the center of the world. Kraków has had so many historical ties with Europe. In our youth, it was always a great event whenever we had the opportunity to travel to this city. I'm really grateful to Mr. Charles Michel, um, the president of the European Council, for being with us here today. It always serves politicians uh, to visit with various uh, groups, communities, and uh, the president uh, has uh, sailed the Central European waters with us. And I have to say that uh, you met with us with open eyes and open ears. For the V4, Benelux countries have always provided uh, inspiration. Yourself, being the former Prime Minister of Belgium, comes here with the first-hand knowledge, and we truly appreciate your willingness to share your knowledge and expertise. And, uh, yes, we celebrate the 30th anniversary today, but to be quite honest, we are looking several centuries back. The first Visegrad cooperation started many centuries ago. The rulers of the Central European countries at that time set up that first cooperative effort, and that historical perspective brings uh, the new dimension of our cooperation. And currently, this area is very successful, as uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki has explained. We feel the weight and the importance of today paired with uh, historical importance. Thirty years ago, myself, I was the member of the parliament that gave the mandate to the Hungarian government to start the Visegrad uh, cooperation. I remember that time. I remember the moving speeches of that time. Thirty years ago, everyone in Hungary thought that uh, our future depends on the Central European cooperation. At that time, we faced magnitude of uh, challenges. We had to reform the economy. We had to step back uh, from the Eastern economic bloc, and uh, we had to find a new place for ourselves in the new world. But uh, we found the strength in ourselves, and we found partners to reinforce the Central European cooperation. And just to repeat after Mateusz, my great friend, I have to say that we are the economic area of uh, Central Europe. We are the region of Europe that has been growing at the fastest rate in Europe. And speaking of vaccine, as I explained to my colleagues today, in Hungary, we've been vaccinating at a very great rate. We want to make sure that vaccination action is rolled out at the fast possible rate with uh, all respect for safety and security. We need, we need to know that what we have is effective, but speed is at this time more important than the price. Today, I also suggested that vaccination and vaccine should be politics-free. There are geopolitical debates going on. There are historical differences that we all acknowledge. We tend to have different tastes. But that should never be part of our discussion about the vaccine. We should be focused on a vaccine that provides protection to people. We cannot divide vaccines um, into the Eastern or Western vaccines. And therefore, today I said that we need to have just a good vaccine for everyone. Perhaps I should have used the stronger words. It would be highly irresponsible if we would be focused on political games instead of saving human lives. S countries of uh, Central Europe fully realize that there are larger countries out there, but we want to be competitive against larger players. And we can be competitive if in our thinking, in our planning, we are running one step ahead of others. And this is the secret of the competitiveness of the Central Europe. 
And today we talked not only about vaccines, but we were also talking about uh, resetting the economy after the virus. That will be critical over the next few months. We need to share the measures that we take at the political and economic level. We have to make sure that we are comparable with each other because the resetting of economy is not something that happens uh, automatically. It takes huge work and um, commitment from the government. For instance, in Hungary, we have already adopted certain measures that uh, Poland uh, started to implement. And V4 has a good luck here, because in this group we have two people that used to serve as a Minister of Finances, and they were very effective. So not everyone becomes the Prime Minister without being a minister first. Some people had to serve as finance ministers because before they were promoted to the Prime Minister's office. So Mateusz and Andrzej do bring in this experience to the table. And uh, we are going to lever that in our effective economic policy. So I'm really hopeful when I'm looking to the future. Thank you. And now, Mr. Igor Matovich, the Prime Minister of the Slovak Republic. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope uh, my Polish pronunciation has been correct. And thank you very much for being here today, for celebrating this important anniversary together with us. During the pandemic, so many of us uh, go day by day thinking about the pandemic, vaccinations, restrictions, thinking of when can we start to return to the normal life. However, we should not neglect such important anniversaries. We should celebrate them. It is an opportunity to sum up our achievements. 30 years is a long enough period for us to make some summing up. The Visegrad group has reached maturity and it makes me smile when I think that we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Visegrad 4, which was created as Visegrad 3, because it was Poland, Hungary and Czechoslovakia to begin with. And now we have the same countries, the same citizens, but after the split of Czechoslovakia, now we are a Visegrad 4. Over the years, uh, we were tested and we can see that we've been a very coherent group. Slovakia separated from the Czech Republic and it embarked on a road at the beginning of which we were considered to be the black hole of Europe and we had to prove ourselves. Our partners, Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, did not reject us. They supported us. They helped us. They joined the North Atlantic Treaty organizations before we did. Slovakia had to deserve this and had to wait for longer. However, the support made it possible for us to join the NATO, to make up for the delays and to join the European Union together as a group of countries. So the Visegrad group was predated our membership in the European Union. This was our first community, a community that we created together for this region of Europe. And the history has proven us right. Indeed, it was the right decision to establish this group. Sometimes we have discussions and arguments, putting into question the very existence of the Visegrad group. Uh, people are asking whether we are to be the troublemaker of the European Union. Do we always need to have a different point of view or a different position? It's not true. We are working together in order to prepare a joint position, common decisions, that can then be discussed with other member states of the European Union that share the European home with us. And, of course, 
it is not true that we always need to have the very same view on everything. It doesn't also mean that we need to agree on everything amongst us or that we need to agree on everything in the European Union. The Visegrad group is a rather informal setting where we can express our opinions freely and um, then we can discuss them on the forum of the European Union. Let me take this opportunity to thank our host, Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Poland, for organizing this summit. And I would also like to thank Mr. Charles Michel, the President of the European Council, for being here with us. It is an opportunity to celebrate together, but also to take a closer look at the works of the Visegrad Group. Let me also thank Viktor Orban and Andrzej Babish. They represent countries that are also members of our community. We are living through very difficult times throughout the world and in Europe as well. We are faced with problems and challenges. The problems and challenges have changed over the last year. A year ago, when I was appointed the Prime Minister, I was not aware that we would be given this surprise gift of the pandemic and the restrictions, the economic slowdown that follows with it. If we look at the situation in the Slovak Republic, uh, the fatality rate uh, is probably the highest in the V4 group. We have not as yet detected the British variant. Um, During our discussions, we focused on the vaccination campaign, looking at it as the road to recovery, thanks to a speedy vaccination campaign. We want to bring back the freedom to our citizens. Visegrad Group is never an outdated project. I would like to part with you, my colleagues, while wishing the Visegrad Group to remain stable and strong and to remain strong even when we are no longer Prime Ministers. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First, I would like to thank um, Mateusz Morawiecki for inviting us and hosting this meeting. I would like to also appreciate Charles Michel for arriving and joining us here. We are in, we keep in touch through the video conferencing and over the phone, but uh, when you are able to meet face to face, it's a different story. And, and that was very important that we are able to meet here in person. The V4 cooperation celebrated the 30th anniversary last Monday, but uh, our friendly relations have been in place for a long time. And let me emphasize that V4, it's not a political bloc. V4 is the economic bloc, 65 million our citizens. And, and these are the citizens for whom we fight. We are fighting for their economic interests and we are fighting for the best interest of Europe. We want to make sure that Europe is a successful project. We want to make sure that Europe is able to overcome all the challenges. Prime Minister Morawiecki explained why we are so successful within our bloc. We have a low unemployment rate not to mention the pandemic, of course. We have a healthy GDP growth. We have um, low taxes, and we are a great place for investments. The Visegrad Group has a strong voice in Europe, especially after the most recent European elections. 
we have had excellent collaboration in place and uh, we are coming up with the initiatives that we propose to Europe. Therefore, I'm really happy that we signed together our anniversary declaration where we summarize our accomplishment to this date and we are forward-looking to the future. We've talked about it, and I would like to repeat that clearly. We have uh, specific proposals for Europe. What I mean is the Schengen. It is uh, a pity that Europe doesn't have a clear-cut plan for the Schengen or for the Western Balkans and Serbia. And this is truly regrettable because uh, we could have taken advantage of our influence there, and this is important for the future of Europe, for security of Europe, and for our united uh, efforts to fence off illegal migration and uh, smugglers and human traffickers. We are not always uh, achieved the same thing together, but whatever we have declared jointly so far w was later proven successful and other countries followed. We want to be proactive with international policy. We want to solve the issues with Turkey. We want to have a good situation in Libya. We want to have a trade agreement with the U.S. This is in the best interest of all of us. V4 is a huge automotive player. We manufacture cars and parts. We are the first trade partner for Germany. And again, we have great creative people living in this part of the world, hardworking people. We are successful. Obviously, now we have the pandemic, and, and the pandemic uh, has affected uh, the life of everyone, all the people in, in this part of the world. The situation is not as good. People are frustrated, and uh, they are fed up with all the restrictions. Uh, the situations that we have in the healthcare sector and the hospital is not that good in our case. And I would like to acknowledge Victor and Mateusz, uh, for their proposal, they claim that if we uh, don't have sufficient number of hospital beds, they would be able to accommodate our patients. We were offered the same kind of assistance by Saxony and uh, Bavaria, but hopefully we'll be able to cope with it. To me, the only solution to this trauma is uh, vaccine. And for this reason, I, I'm, I feel sorry that despite the fact that the European Union was negotiating with the pharma industry, in good faith, believing that pharmaceutical companies will be very serious about it. We have made prepayments. 3.2 billion euro was the prepayment prepayment made to the manufacturers of vaccines. We ordered 2 billion doses for 370 plus million people living in the European Union, and the supplies are delayed. It's not only that they are late with deliveries. We've heard that these manufacturers have exported um, vaccines outside the European Union, despite the fact that they manufacture that in the European Union. And we talked about it, that we need to put a stop to that. We need to roll out the vaccines. We have to vaccinate people fast. And the experience of Viktor Orban is meaningful to all of us. We need to make sure that we have as antibodies um, available, antibodies that are donated uh, by those who have recovered from COVID, and thus they can actually help uh, others recover. We need to save lives of our people. We do whatever we can to make sure that it happens, but there are no doubts that the vaccine is the main solution. We need to take the learning from the first wave of the pandemic. At that time, we had to rely on PPEs uh, imported from China and from beyond Europe because we didn't have local manufacturers at that time. We should take conclusions from that. And we should make sure that we never find ourselves in such a situation again. This is a general comment. It's not only about the health sector, 
But anyway, to me, it was a very important meeting. Again, I would like to thank Mateusz for being such a great host. I would like to thank Charles for joining our meeting here, and I'm looking forward to the future cooperation. Thank you very much. We shall now proceed with questions from the media. One question per country. A question from the Polish media. Polsat News, Piotr Witkowski. The question that is addressed to both the President of the European Council and the Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki. Uh, Mr. Charles Michel did mention the question of accessibility of vaccines. What activities will be undertaken by the European Union in order to ascertain a greater availability of vaccines throughout Europe and what happens as vaccines are being uh, transported out of the European Union uh, regardless of the shortage. Well, thank you very much and let me allow Mr. Jean-Michel to answer the question first. As we have heard uh, a moment ago, uh, we signed a contract for two billion doses as the European Union. Uh, this morning we discussed how to speed up the transportation or the delivery or the rollout of the vaccinations to Poland, to the Visegrad Group, to the European Union member states. This is the priority for the European Union. We have to be working round the clock in order to make sure that what has been contracted will be delivered. This is an absolute priority. Apart from that, the heads of governments have a role to play because We need to coordinate at the highest possible level in order to manage the situation successfully, in order to prepare for the new mutations, for the new variants of the virus. The European Commission is working on that. There is a special task force that has been established. Uh, it consists of representatives of the pharmaceutical companies. We need to prepare for the future events. And indeed, we need to speed up the rollout of the vaccinations. I do share the concern of prime ministers of the Visegrad countries and of other prime ministers. We need to roll up our sleeves and get on with the work. And let me present my personal point of view. I believe that the European Commission should use the economic strength of the European Union in order to put pressure on these big pharma companies. In the summer last year, as Andrzej Babisz has said, we were the first to sign the contracts. We made a considerable prepayment, 3 billion euros. This prepayment financed the clinical studies, the production of the products, and now it turns out that these companies manage the distribution of the products in such a way so that they can actually bypass some of the very general provisions of the contracts that we had signed. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Charles Michel. He's been doing all he can in order to make sure that Europe receives as many vaccines as possible. It is the role for the European Union, for the European Commission. Next week, we shall have a meeting of the European Council. It will be a video conference, and this will certainly be the main topic. We have to uh, make sure, maybe even force the big pharma to respect the contract. they are operating on the global markets. We were the first ones, or one of the first ones, to sign the contracts, and we should be receiving many more vaccinations as soon as possible. Now, in February, in March, not in September, October, by then we should have a, a surplus of vaccinations on the global market. We need the vaccinations now, as soon as possible, in order to get rid of the pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. And now the Hungarian media will ask the question. 
Um, good afternoon. My question goes to Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Uh, not only in Hungary, but also in Slovak Republic and uh, in Poland, uh, there was a special article published about uh, the calling that we should deliver, all of us. So the question is, what can we do within the next uh, 40, 30 years to actually deliver on that? our vocation, to show our solidarity, to show our loyalty, to show our fidelity. Well, Igor, our friend, has just talked about it. He said that uh, after the split of Czechoslovakia, uh, Slovak Republic joined V4. Today, Slovak Republic plays the key strategic role in our cooperation. When you look at the map, it becomes very obvious. The remaining three countries are neighbors of each other, ourselves. We are just neighboring Slovakia, which means that the Slovak Republic brings together the north of Central Europe with the south of Central Europe. Therefore, they play an enormous role in uh, keeping us together so that we are sticking together. If we want to succeed over the next 30 years, we have to stick together, day in, day out. And this is the secret of the success. And now we are inviting the Slovak media. Good afternoon. Uh, let me revisit the question of vaccines. We've heard from Prime Minister Orban that uh, he appealed to his partners that we should not look at the origin of the vaccine, where it was manufactured. We know that tomorrow the Slovak government is going to make a decision about the Sputnik vaccine. Now, speaking of tomorrow's discussion, are you going to follow the uh, Hungarian example and uh, are you going to have discussions with the Russians and what is uh, the approach of the European Union to that? Is there is an initiative like that within the V4? What I mean that V4 will try to make an acquisition of such vaccines on their own. The topic of the Russian vaccine was uh, discussed during our meeting, and my opinion is very close to the one that Viktor Orban voiced. The protection of life and health should have nothing to do with geopolitics. The virus knows no difference between the East or the West or between political convictions. It is our duty as politicians to take all possible measures and efforts to protect human life, no matter where the vaccine originates. We should provide vaccine that is safe and effective at the same time. And now the question from uh, the Czech media. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the Czech television Channel. Let me refer to the question asked by my colleagues. So what is the approach of Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki towards the Sputnik vaccine? And as for Mr. Babish, I would like to ask about the travel restrictions. Hungary has closed its borders. Slovak Republic is very restrictive. Uh, the Czech Republic as well. But when we look at Poland and compare it uh, with the Slovak Republic and the Czech Republic. The situation is in general better, but a third wave of the pandemic may arrive. So are the changes in the restrictions planned? And would Prime Minister Babish prefer for the situation to remain as it is, with Poland's borders being open, or should it change? Well, yes. We spoke about many things, but not about travel restrictions for citizens as much. We spoke about road transport. The situation on the German borders violates the principles of the common market. Uh, we discussed this uh, with Mr. Scharmischer. We uh, spoke uh, with uh, Austria, with the Slovak Republic, with the Germany. Uh, this is something that never happened, not even during the first wave on the pandemic. So this was the first issue that we discussed. We also informed Mr. Charles Michel that we would like uh, 
to receive his help as our drivers are subjected to very harsh extreme conditions. And as much as I understand our German partners, during the first wave of the pandemic, we were very flexible. And uh, we do not like the current situation. We hope that the situation will improve as we are not able to paralyze the international transport. It will have impact on trade, production, everything. We also spoke about the European COVID vaccination passport. So the question was whether a document confirming the vaccination is enough or does it have to be accompanied by a negative result of a PCR test? Well, vaccines are the first and the most important issue. We need vaccines fast, and this was the most important task for me. Prime Minister Morawiecki, as Andre has observed, the free movement of goods is the most important thing because our economies depend on that, the economies of the Visegrad countries, but also of the whole of Europe. Uh, we all go through the COVID pandemic, and we have greater hope of recovering if we are able to continue our trade. We need to make sure that goods can be transported across borders, and we are very concerned about restrictions introduced by some countries. Indeed, we are concerned about the potential third wave, or maybe this is just a very long second wave that we are living through. We know it is a very serious situation. I understand my colleagues, Victor, but also Igor, who is considering to purchase the vaccines as soon as possible, regardless of the origin. They want to have vaccines that are, uh, have been tested, that they have a confirmed efficacy, and that is available as soon as possible. We are racing against time. We need to win against this pandemic, and every week means losses, the loss of life, and uh, life is priceless, but it also means economic losses, and this can be a very high price to pay. It will take us years to recover, only because someone else, a country from the Far East, wishes to uh, actually replace us on other markets. This can happen to Polish companies, to the Czech companies, Hungarian companies. So vaccines are our priority. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. This was the last question of the press conference. Thank you very much, Prime Ministers, Mr. President. Thank you very much for taking part in this conference.